previous video, we discussed the academic lecture listening passage, including understanding the importance of genre expectations, common spoken cohesive devices, as well as the importance and strategy of taking notes. In this video, we will look at the academic conversations. Once again, uh, it's important to remember that there are eight question types on the TOEFL falling into three basic categories. Questions about basic comprehension, pragmatic understanding questions, and connecting information questions. So first off, some basic features of the academic conversation will look very similar to that of the lecture. A professor will be lecturing on a specific academic topic. For example, instead of just saying World War II, uh, he or she might be discussing a particular battle. The organization is very similar to something that we would see in a reading passage. And different parts of the lecture may be re repeated to focus on more specific information. This is often called the replay question. However, one key difference between an academic lecture and an academic conversation is the fact that the professor will be ans asking questions and addressing specific points to students in the classroom. So though this would appear to be a, a significant difference, it's actually a very helpful point that will most likely improve your understanding of the material being presented. Now, in terms of solving the academic conversation, uh, I think you will see that much like the lecture, they use a lot of the same ideas, focusing on common signal words that we use in speaking contexts, using those spoken conventions or cohesive devices to indicate where important concepts are given, and again, understanding how a lecture is basically organized, especially uh, that you would see on the TOEFL. Now, uh, again, we have to remind you that note-taking is permitted on the test, and we should take notes when we listen. So the challenge of the TOEFL listening section really is the ability to capture all of the important and not minor details and concepts in one listening. However, in this video, we will analyze how these details and concepts are divided up among the different participants in the conversation. Now remember, don't try to transcribe every word or idea you hear. That's obviously impossible. You will miss some information if you try to look for a word-for-word -word transcription. So we need to actively process information that we hear and try to put the information together in the order that you hear it. Now, uh, the first thing we need to discuss today is looking at the role of students. First, let's talk about the role of students in general in a university environment. The TOEFL is trying to give you the basic idea of the skills that we need to succeed in a university environment both in and out of the classroom. Throughout the entire test, so this is including the speaking, writing, reading sections as well, you will get a small sample of those skills and the ways they are utilized in and around a university campus. For example, the reading section is really involved more with measuring your academic and technical content knowledge especially your ability to learn new information from a textual source and then to demonstrate that comprehension. But the listening section is a little more broad, and I think that's important to distinguish at this point. The idea here is not only do we need to focus on learning academic and technical content, but we also need to understand how to interact appropriately with professors and other figures of authority in a university environment. So the key to think about of the students in the academic conversation. The idea here is that students are active participants in this academic discussion. And again, the professor is the one who's sort of conducting it. But one important thing to notice that this is very different from a real university classroom. Obviously, the students on the TOEFL are helping to serve a particular function. Uh, and the idea here is that real university students often make mistakes or are bored or not engaged or often don't know the answers to questions that professors ask. But the ones on the TOEFL are almost the opposite. They're extremely knowledgeable, curious, and interested, and the surprising thing here is that they're almost never mistaken. Now, how does that help us? Well, if you really think about it, when we, uh, and especially when we analyze the, uh, the transcript later, the students on the TOEFL seem to always ask questions at the exact moments, or at least to be able to answer them. And it really helps the professor sort of deliver key ideas and concepts from the lecture. 
So really, the way to think about it here is that students, their basic function on the test is to help the, keep the lecture moving, to help guide the professor through materials that he or she is trying to present. Now, in our example today, the topic is chemistry. So we're going to start much in the same way we did in the previous video, by thinking about the genre considerations of the topic. For example, how much do we already know about this topic? How uh, are passages like this organized? Well, for example, chemistry lectures are often organized by ideas or concepts, as well as following certain processes that involve certain sequences. Now, which specific point of this broad topic will they be discussing? Well, again, chemistry, just like all of the other academic topics on the TOEFL, is a pretty broad discipline. So which specific ideas or concepts will be discussed? Uh, will it be discussing a particular chemical process or specific chemical elements? And of course another consideration is to think about how does this fact, uh, how is this affected by the fact that it's an academic conversation instead of just a lecture? Well as we said before one thing we need to pay attention to is that the students will be interacting throughout. So keep in mind that whenever the student gives a question these will help serve as a way to guide your note-taking, highlighting important ideas and information you need to understand. Now, when we discussed the organization of a typical lecture, we said that on the TOEFL you will generally notice that the introduction of the lecture will be the first 30 or 60 seconds, the body of the argument will be about 4 to 5 minutes, and then the conclusion, if it's present, will be the final 10 to 20 seconds. Now, how will this be different in the conversations? Well, uh, again, the introduction itself may not be a formal introduction. It, may, it might actually be the first question or idea from a student. And again, this might uh, get some sort of explanation in the first 30 to 60 seconds. When we talk about the body, we're really focusing on the question and answers that the students are given uh, and the ones they ask to the professor. And uh, obviously, you will hear lots of examples of the professor explaining concepts as well. And then if there is a conclusion, it might be some small wrap-up from the professor. But you might notice more on the academic conversation section that there aren't any conclusions because the professor may be moving on to a different topic by the end of the conversation. Now, in terms of strategy for this particular part of the test, we've discussed individual strategies in the first two videos about the regular conversation and the academic lecture. So when it comes to the academic conversation, first thing we need to notice is that often the conversation will be organized in a similar way to the lecture. And we're going to follow kind of the same basic outline, though we are going to make some particular changes to our format. First off, since we don't have a formal introduction or conclusion, we're going to choose slightly different words. So now, take out a piece of paper, divide the paper into two parts, and write down the following headings, leaving plenty of space in between each one the topic and the body. And it'll look sort of like this on a piece of paper. Now the topic, of course, will be kind of what we thought of as the introduction. So in the first question, the, the student will most likely be addressing what the topic will be and that professor will spend the rest of the time kind of discussing. Of course, the body is where the rest of the information will come after the professor gives more information. Now, as we take notes, remember something we mentioned in the previous video. Each time the professor or student adds a point to the body of the conversation, move your pencil down to the next line and write down the information. And we'll demonstrate this uh, in just a moment. So now we're going to get ready to listen, but just to the first 30 to 60 seconds, and actually we'll do 60. And the idea is we'll be listening to the introduction of the topic. So now get ready to take notes. So, are there any questions? Yes, um, Professor Harrison, you were saying that the periodic table is predictive. What exactly does that mean? I mean, I understand how it organizes the elements, but where's the prediction? Okay, let's look at our periodic table again. Okay, it groups elements into categories that share certain properties, right? Uh-huh and it's arranged according to increasing atomic number, which is... The number of protons in each atom of an element. Right. 
Well, early versions of the periodic table had gaps, missing elements. Every time you have one more proton, you have another element. And then, oops, there'd be an atomic number for which there was no known element. And the um, prediction was that an element with that atomic number existed somewhere, but it just hadn't been found yet. And its location in the table would tell you what properties it should have. It was really pretty exciting for scientists at that time to find the missing elements and confirm their predicted properties. Okay, so now that we've listened to the first th uh, 60 seconds, let's see what ideas we've identified so far about the topic. And again, notice how I'll move to the next line whenever a new idea or concept was discussed. So under the topic, the first kind of question was asked by the student. Well, the periodic table, uh, is it predictive? What exactly does that mean? So notice how it's going to be uh, the idea is that the periodic table was grouped into categories and that each one involved an atomic number. And the professor immediately asked what does the atomic number mean and students responded with it's the number of protons. So again there's that idea that students always seem to know the answer to the questions the professor asks. But then he mentions that early periodic tables had missing numbers. So, in other words, there were gaps in the table. And that at the time, it was pretty exciting to be able to find missing elements. So again, if you notice, within even the first 60 seconds, we have about six or seven ideas that we've written down under the topic. So again, each time the speakers changed, we moved the pencil to the next line. And of course, this will also be true for every transition to a new point or detail. This is something we mentioned in the previous video. Now, before we listen to the entire passage, just remember a few things we've discussed before. Again, when the screen changes, make sure to pay attention and write down any information we see on them. So again, new, new terms, new words, uh, even particular visual ideas will be important for us to note. If we hear, hear any new vocabulary words, especially technical terms, we need to write them down exactly as they're spelled. And remember, don't try to transcribe every word we hear. We want to paraphrase information where necessary. Now get ready to listen. We're going to be taking notes now on the entire conversation. So, are there any questions? Yes, um, Professor Harrison, you were saying that the periodic table is predictive. What exactly does that mean? I mean, I understand how it organizes the elements, but where's the prediction? Okay, let's look at our periodic table again. Okay, it groups elements into categories that share certain properties, right? Uh-huh. And it's arranged according to increasing atomic number which is... The number of protons in each atom of an element. Right. Well, early versions of the periodic table had gaps, missing elements. Every time you have one more proton, you have another element. And then, oops, there'd be an atomic number for which there was no known element. And the um, prediction was that an element with that atomic number existed somewhere but it just hadn't been found yet. And its location in the table would tell you what properties it should have. It was really pretty exciting for scientists at that time to find the missing elements and confirm their predicted properties. Um, actually, that reminds me of a good example of this. Element 43. See on the table uh, the symbols for elements 42 and 44? Well, in early versions of the table, there was no symbol for an element with 43 protons because an element had yet been discovered with 43 protons. So the periodic table had a gap between elements 42 and 44. And then uh, in 1925, a team of chemists led by a scientist named Ida Tack claimed that they had found element 43. They had been uh, using a relatively new technology called X-ray spectrum and they were using this to examine an ore sample. And they claimed they'd found an element with 43 protons. And they named it Masurium. 
Um, Professor Harrison? Then how come in my periodic table here, element 43 is TC? That's technetium, right? Okay, let me add... Oh, actually, uh, that's the point I'm coming to. Hardly anyone believed that TAG had discovered a new element. X-ray spectroscopy was a new method at the time, and they were never able to isolate enough masurium to have a weighable sample to convince everyone of their discovery, so they were discredited. But then, 12 years later, in 1937, a different team became the first to synthesize an element using a cyclotron, and that element had... 43 protons? That's right. But they named it technetium to emphasize that it was artificially created with technology. And people thought that synthesizing this element, making it artificially, was the only way to get it. We still hadn't found it occurring in nature. Now, element 43, whether you call it mesurium or technetium, is radioactive. Why does that matter? What's true of a radioactive element? It decays? It turns into other elements? Oh, so does that explain why it was missing in the periodic table? Exactly. Because of its radioactive decay, element 43 doesn't last very long. And, therefore, if it ever had been present on Earth, it would have decayed ages ago. So, the Masurian people were obviously wrong, and the Technetian people were right. Right? Well, that was then. Now we know that element 43 does occur naturally. It can be naturally generated from uranium atoms that have spontaneously split. And guess what? The ore sample the Masurian group was working with had plenty of uranium in it. Enough to split into measurable amounts of Masurium. So, tax team might very well have found small amounts of mesurium in their ore sample. It's just that once it was generated from split uranium, it decayed very quickly. And you know, here's an incredible irony. Ida Tack, the chemist who led the mesurium team, well, she was the first to suggest that uranium could break up into smaller pieces. But she didn't know that that was the defense of her own discovery of element 43. So, is my version of the periodic table wrong? Should element 43 really be called Masurium? <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, it's hard to tell for sure after all this time if Ida Tank's group did discover element 43. They didn't um, publish enough detail on their methods or instruments for us to know for sure. But I like to think element 43 was discovered twice. As mesurium, it was the first element discovered that occurs in nature only from spontaneous fission. And as technetium, it was the first element discovered in a laboratory. And, of course, it was an element the periodic table led us to expect existed, before anyone had found it or made it. Now let's look at the questions. Once again, we're going to try to analyze the question types based on the information provided to us from uh, ETS. So looking at the questions now at the, uh, in the quick prep download, let's go ahead and try to analyze what the questions are and look at their answers. So first off, in question 26, in the beginning of the lecture, a student asks a question about the periodic table. How does the story of element 43 answer her question? Now, this particular question is actually something we have not seen before in our examples. This one's most likely what we call the understanding organization question. Now, the understanding organization question comes from the connecting information category. So, let's take a few more minutes to look at the connecting information category to see if we can understand it a little better. So, the connecting information questions are more commonly found with the lectures and the academic conversations listening passages. These questions usually involve trying to understand how individual ideas connect to the overall purpose of the passage. Now, we discussed the idea of an inference question in a previous video, so now we're going to take some time to look at the other two types, the connecting content and understanding organization question, and that's the one we're going to start with first. So in this example, if you'll notice the professor is using a story to kind of indirectly answer a question asked by the student. 
Now, this is often uh, the type of question you will see with the understanding organization, in which you have some sort of comparison uh, to other ideas to help per perhaps illustrate a particular point. Other examples of understanding organization may involve questions about why a professor organized the lecture in this way, or how the professor actually organized this, this particular lecture. So in this particular question, we're actually seeing how the professor is using a story to illustrate and explain a particular idea. So at first, it may be kind of difficult to follow because the professor is not just directly explaining uh, what element 43 was, but actually using some sort of historical information to answer it for us. Now, the connecting content question is a little more difficult to recognize in some cases. Now, in one situation, though, uh, it's very easy to see because the connecting content question sometimes involves placing ideas into a chart or table. So, for example, if the professor gives a particular sequence of ideas or concepts, you may have to place the information into their correct categories. Now, this is just an example. This is not provided to us from the test. But uh, I've given you an example of what it might look like on the test. So, for example, on the left, we have the two concepts, Messerium and Technetium. And the idea would be, can you identify which one belongs in which category? So, for example, which one was discovered in nature and which one was discovered in the laboratory? So this would be a particular example where you would have to place an idea. Remember which idea goes with which category. So again, you're kind of connecting ideas uh, in the passage itself to the uh, particular details the professor gives. Other examples of this question type involve taking a specific point from the passage and demonstrating an understanding of how it connects to another idea. For example, you may have to draw a conclusion from the information presented in the question. We'll see some of these questions in this video. Now again, uh, ETS does not provide us with any specific information or, categor or categorization of these questions. So really, I'm just trying to uh, guess the question types based on the information ETS provides to us. So again, in this particular question, question 26, it appears to me to be an understanding organization question since the professor is using a story to demonstrate uh, basically an answer to the, the entire question in the uh, conversation. Well, now let's go ahead and talk about answering the question. So why, in fact, does the professor use this story? What is it actually going to illustrate uh, throughout the rest of the um, particular passage? Well, again, it, you could think of this, too, as it's describing the basic purpose of the passage. It really does explain how we can use the periodic table to do something. Well, let's take a look at our answer choices and see which one we can eliminate first. Uh, so first off, as we look at A, it's providing an example of an element whose place in the periodic table was moved. Uh, this clearly is false. This is not referring to something that was moved, but actually something that wasn't there in the beginning. So this was referred to as a gap in the, in the table. Okay, uh, example B, providing an example whose existence was predictable from the periodic table. Well, one of the things they talked about is they, they number these particular elements because they know how many protons are in each one and can predict the properties based on the, how many protons they might find. So this one seems like an entirely possible answer. So we'll keep this one for a moment. Let's look at C. By providing an example of an element which scientists predicted was from, formed from uranium. Well, the idea about uranium was actually not mentioned until almost the end of the passage. So in this case, uranium itself was not part of the original answer at the beginning of the lecture. So in this case, we're probably going to eliminate C. Now in, act, in D, we did see an example of an element, and they did talk about the fact that it was made artificially. That is part of the idea of element 43. But actually, in the entire discussion, it's not just the fact they created it artificially, but then later they were able to create something um, basically from nature. So in this case, even though D looks like a possibility, we're probably going to eliminate D as well. And in this case, B is the only answer. And again, B is a good example of the type of question that might also be a general purpose question because it includes language that's more expansive. It's not just focusing on a particular detail, but it is focusing on the fact that this was an example of how the periodic table can, be, uh, can include predictable information. So again, this may be an understanding organization question. It possibly could be a purpose question as well. 
But in my opinion, since the professor uses a story, it probably does illustrate the fact that we have to follow this story throughout the entire conversation. Let's move on. Question 27. What does the professor say about early versions of the periodic table? Well, most likely this is looking at a particular detail. So we have to kind of figure out, in terms of the early versions, uh, what details did the professor give? Well, for this particular element, let's go down the list and see which ones we think we can keep and which ones we can eliminate. So, starting with A, early versions listed two names. Well, it's very possible two names were mentioned in the essay, uh, in the uh, conversation, so let's keep this one for just a moment. Early versions had the incorrect atomic number for some elements. Uh, no, that's not exactly what he mentioned. In, in fact, the idea was that the periodic table had a very strong predictive element, and they still had many to discover. So in this case, they didn't mention anything about atomic numbers being incorrect. So we'll eliminate this one. Early versions were not as easy to use as modern versions. Well, uh, this may be possible, but this was not a particular detail or point that the professor mentioned. He only mentioned that early versions were perhaps exciting in the fact that there were still things to, that were missing. Whereas the modern versions now have a more complete picture in the periodic table. So in this case, we're going to eliminate C as well. Now in the last one, early versions did not list an element for every atomic number. This one pretty much uh, goes along with what the professor was saying about the gaps in the uh, periodic table. So D does definitely look like a possibility. Let's keep that one. So, which one do we think is the better choice? Well, in this case, D is the one that uh, does, does kind of correlate with what the professor was saying. That in the early versions, there were some that were missing. So in this case, we can identify D as the answer. Let's move on. Now, question 28 is interesting. It asks us to think about a fact, something that was directly stated in the actual uh, passage. So what fact inspired researchers to give the name technetium to element 43? Well, again, this is most likely a detail question as well. So if we look at the choices, the idea is to think about technetium, since this was one of the particular words used in the, article, in the passage. Well, first off, uh, the element was radioactive. Did this inspire researchers to give that name? Possible, so we'll keep this one for a moment. The element was derived from uranium. Well, uh, in this case, again, uranium was not necessarily talking about this particular fact. So we're going to eliminate this particular idea. And C, the element was created artificially. Well, uh, technetium, if we notice the part of tech, is what the professor was referring to in terms of technology. It seems very possible that it was created artificially. So we'll keep this one. And the element was found using X-ray spectroscopy. Well, uh, this is one of the tricks here that we see on the test. And this is difficult because we have to keep a lot of information straight. In this case, X-ray spectroscopy was actually used to find masurium, not technetium. So in this case, we have to remember that this one does not relate. So which one is the answer? Well, the better answer in this case would be C that it was created artificially. And this is actually uh, similar to the word that he used in the lecture. Let's move on. Now let's look at question 29. What characteristic of element 43 might explain why the scientific community doubted the findings of Ida Tack's team? Now, this might look like a detail question, but again, it's actually a connecting content question. Part of the reason is because we're asked to make some sort of uh, conclusion or kind of think about the possibility as to why this particular characteristic might, um, might explain a particular concept. So now let's look at the answer choices to see which ones we can eliminate and which ones we can keep. Uh, a, element 43 has a very fast rate of decay. Well, this was definitely mentioned in the article that element 43 did decay very quickly. So we're going to keep this one just for a moment. Uh, B, element 43 always contains small amounts of other elements. Well, they did mention that when they, um, in their sample, they did find other elements or smaller uh, parts 
in their particular discovery. So again, this might be something we might want to keep as well. Okay, let's look at element 40, uh, look at C. Element 43 cannot be created artificially. Well, this is one that we can easily eliminate because that was part of the discussion in the uh, lecture itself, that element 43 initially was created in an artificial way. And then finally, D. Element 43's radioactivity makes it easy to isolate and measure. Well, again, this is one that we can eliminate as, uh, we can also eliminate because in the article, uh, in the lecture rather, they talked about the fact that it was actually difficult to produce because of uh, the possibility that it might decay very quickly. So we're going to eliminate this one too. So this brings us back to the first two choices. Which one do we think is the better choice? Well, again, A is the only one really between the two that we can actually prove from the lecture because it has a very fast rate of decay. This is often why the scientific community was unable to reproduce the findings uh, very easily. So in this case, A is the answer. Now let's look at question 30. What does the professor believe about the claim that Ida Tax team made about element 43? Well, in this case, it's possible that this might be a pragmatic understanding question, and especially involving uh, the professor's attitude about something. Now, this is very possible. Uh, again, ETS does not provide us enough information or to give us direction as to what specific type of question this is, so I'm only guessing that perhaps it's asking about the attitude the professor has. However, it also might be looking at a, a type of inference or inferring information that the professor might give. So that's a possibility as well. But let's look at how we can solve the question. So first off, we have to think about what does the professor actually believe about this claim. Well, let's kind of go through and see which ones we can eliminate and which ones we want to keep. So first off, scientists should have accepted the claim when it was first published. Well, uh, again, one of the problems he mentions at the beginning is that pr the scientists were unable to reproduce uh, for a very long time or to isolate. So in this case, we could probably eliminate A right away. Uh, for B, there is not enough evidence to know if the team actually discovered element 43. Well, we do remember that the professor said that the uh, team itself did not keep very detailed records or publish a lot of information about the method. So in this case, we'll keep a possibility here. We'll put a question mark next to it. For C, the team's unusual scientific methods were unreliable. Well, again, that's possible the professor might have believed that, but he didn't actually use any words or terms to that effect. So in this case, um, we're going to eliminate C. Finally, if the team's ore sample had contained element 43, the team would have been able to isolate a weighable amount. Well, the professor did mention something about the difficulty of isolating a weighable amount because it was unable, they were, had difficulty keep re reproducing the element. So we'll keep this one for just a moment. So now looking at our two choices, which one seems to have the strongest connection to the passage? Well, in this case, the answer is going to be B. Again, the professor did actually mention uh, the idea that they didn't have a lot of information published. So in this case, uh, it's very difficult to know uh, for, for certainty if the team had actually discovered it because the professor mentions they didn't have a lot of information about it. So again, this possibly could be understanding the attitude of professor towards it, or it also could be possibly an inference that the question is asking us to make. Let's move on. So finally, question 31 is asking a certain part to be repeated. So this can pretty much, we can pretty much identify right away that this is going to be a replay question, and uh, most likely going to be uh, a pragmatic understanding question. So let's listen again, and then we'll listen to the question. And you know, here's an incredible irony. Ida Tack, the chemist who led the Masurian team, well, she was the first to suggest that uranium could break up into smaller pieces. But she didn't know that that was the defense of her own discovery of element 43. So what does the professor imply about the chemist Ida Tackett when he says this? But she didn't know that that was the defense of her own discovery of element 43. So in this case, again, we're trying to understand what's the particular function of what the professor is saying. What does it actually mean? 
Uh, of course, again, because the, the question uses the word imply, it also might be an imply question, an inference question. So again, most of the pragmatic understanding questions, though, involve replaying. So this one possibly could be a function question. Well, anyway, let's go ahead and look at the answer choices. So, A, she did not realize that the periodic table predicted the radioactivity of element 43. Well, uh, again, that's a very strong possibility. But uh, the key here is to think that she thought she did. So, in this case, we probably can eliminate A right now. B, she didn't understand why her team's findings were dismissed by the scientific community. Well, again, this is a very strong possibility. We're trying to kind of guess what the professor means when he says something like this. So, maybe we'll keep this one for a moment. Uh, her theory about uranium would have explained the presence of element 43 in her team's ore sample. Well, this is a very strong possibility, uh, especially at the end when the professor was talking about the fact that when they had uh, determined the rate of decay of the uranium sample. So in this case, now that they know that it can be, uh, it can be found, the problem is that tax team might have found these small amounts of mesurium. So the problem is once they generated from the split uranium, it decayed very quickly. So in this case, this one's a very strong possibility as well. Finally, her theory about uranium would have explained the errors that created element 43 in a cyclotron. Well, this one is most definitely false, because the cyclotron idea came along after I'd attack. So in this case, we can eliminate D right now. So looking at the two choices that are remaining, which one is the better one? Well, whereas B might have been possible that she didn't understand, the more direct answer in this case would be C. Because the idea is she had a theory about uranium, but she didn't recognize that it actually would support her own idea about this element 43 that they discovered. So now we're going to analyze the transcript. Of course, obviously we cannot look at the transcript any time during the test, just like we can't listen to the conversation more than once. But the purpose of this video is to see what we can learn from this experience. So once again, please take a look at the TOEFL Quick Prep download. The link is list listed below this video. And then look specifically at the third listening activity. And follow along as we examine the transcript a little more closely for some helpful clues and ideas. Now, once again, we're looking for those common spoken conventions. And we'll also kind of pay attention to how the students helped us uh, kind of guide the conversation along. So uh, first off, notice how the professor immediately starts with the idea of questions. And then the, the student essentially lays out the topic for what we're going to learn. The idea that the periodic table is predictive. And basically wants to know where that prediction is going to be. Now, you'll notice that the professor, uh, again, using lots of these uh, kind of spoken conventions, uses, for example, a tag question to kind of begin or continue conversation along. Now, in these particular situations, the professor actually is looking for an answer. So if you notice, like, for example, when the professor says right, and notice here uh, the professor is looking for uh, an answer to fill in the missing information, such as uh, it's a, according to increasing atomic number, which is... So once again, notice how the students always have the answer to the question. That's the thing we mentioned before, that the students are going to kind of help. Uh, first off, here this is called back channeling. The student is kind of just listening and giving acknowledgement that she uh, understands what's being said. And then, uh, again, gives the answer to the question. So as we kind of go along, again, notice that throughout the conversation, uh, the professor is giving kind of similar ideas. The table had gaps or missing elements. So again, notice how these particular things kind of continue to help move the conversation along. Then, of course, we have the uh, beginning of the story. Now, notice here in the first example, the professor is using, uh, in the first uh, paragraph here at the top of the page, uh, notice how the professor is using, again, a rhetorical question. The professor is using this question, see this on the table? Do you, uh, do you see this? 
uh, basically as a way to direct their attention. Now, again, on the TOEFL, you'll be able to see this chart as we demonstrated today, probably a little bit more clearly than we were able to in this video. And then notice again the constant repetition of the idea of 43, 43 protons or element 43. And once the name Mysterium was mentioned, the screen changed. So again, this is a way to show us uh, things that we've already been discussing. How particular ideas get repeated uh, frequently in order for us to kind of follow along. Uh, even the idea of 42 and 44, 42 and 44. These are things that we find much more common in speaking contexts. Now notice how the male professor, uh, male student came in and then again uh, asked a question that kind of continues to guide us along. Even though the element that the professor is discussing is called Mysterium, which was uh, you know using this particular uh, spectroscopy to find, um, the student jumps in with kind of the contradiction. But in my periodic table, it mentions tech, technetium. So the idea here is the student is using an appropriate sort of uh, kind of interrupting device and to get to the professor's attention to say, well, why is it different here? And then notice the professor uses a common speaking convention. That's the point I'm coming to. And again, the professor uses a kind of leading question here, looking for an answer from one of the students. Now, we discussed in the uh, one of the questions that the professor is using a story of, so of sorts to kind of illustrate how a particular element is predicted or found. So notice again, in this case, in this part of the um, of the lecture or the conversation, again, we can we can even go back and notice that the professor is using dates to help kind of also keep some of this information going. Well, in a way, dates kind of follow a sequence, which is very common in, in chemistry. But maybe this is not the type of lecture we would have ex expected exactly. We usually expect to find out more about elements, but maybe not necessarily much about the history of them. So in this case, we can kind of follow along by using dates as well as part of the organizational idea. Okay, uh, as we move along, the professor kind of emphasizes that it was called Technetium because it was artificially created with technology, which was uh, directly related to one of the questions we had uh, in the second part of the video. Now, uh, again, notice we have to distinguish between, like here, for example, the professor says, why does that matter? Well, uh, that may or may not be a rhetorical question, but the next question is much, is much more clear. The professor is looking for an answer here to these questions. So a little bit different from the lecture because obviously now the professor does have students who can answer. And the students, of course, notice uh, even though they look like the student's not sure, uh, it decays, it turns into other elements. So notice the professor, of course, is telling them that's exactly what happens. So as we mentioned before, uh, the students in this particular uh, lecture uh, seem to be very smart and know how to kind of uh, continue information along. Now notice again, element 43 gets repeated quite a bit through the transcript. And this kind of idea of tag question, right, is a way to kind of gauge whether students are paying attention. But notice that the professor here doesn't ex exactly want an answer. So yes, this would be a good example of kind of a rhetorical advice. Uh, in order to keep the students to kind of keep following along. And then, of course, the professor comes back to the researcher, Ida Tack, and refers back to the story of how they exactly um, created this particular Masserium group. And as we said, uh, here's another rhetorical device, and guess what? This is a perfect example uh, of where the students just need to keep listening as the professor is basically saying, here's the next thing I'm going to say. The ore sample the Mysterium group is working with had plenty of uranium, uh, enough to split into measurable amounts of Mysterium. So part of the idea is the professor uses the word irony. It's kind of, uh, kind of strange here that the actual sample that they were using uh, and, and I'd attack the chemist who led the Mysterium team. So again, notice uh, a nice example of restating who I'd attack is. Again, very common in speaking because sometimes it's been a while since we've mentioned the person's name. It might be easy to forget. Well, uh, she was actually the first person to suggest that uranium could break up into smaller pieces. So what she didn't know is that the defense of her own discovery basically helped solidify that of, of element 43. So finally, students kind of bring back to say, well, what about the periodic table itself? So really, the students are also helping bring us to that sort of uh, conclusion or sort of wrap up. 
So even then, the final uh, 20, 10, 20 seconds here really comes back to the idea of, you know, it wasn't really, uh, it's hard to tell for sure if Ida Groups did discover did discover this element. Um, you know, they didn't publish enough material and, and so on. So uh, the professor kind of reiterates what was stated earlier, that the, the, the particular element was discovered twice, first as mesurium uh, and then technetium, as it was the first element discovered in the lab. Now, you'll notice one of the uh, common ways they kind of end the academic conversation. Since it's really not necessarily a lecture, it's maybe part of an overall lecture or class. Uh, notice how the professor may be uh, moving on to a different topic. So notice here, and of course, it was an element that periodically will let us ex to expect existed before anyone found it or made it. So the professor is kind of wrapping up here, and perhaps in other uh, academic conversations, you'll hear the professor say, well, let's move on to this next topic. So again, as we look through the uh, transcript, we can kind of see a lot of the same rhetorical devices used in the lecture section, but because the professor is trying to also kind of string together a conversation with the students, Oftentimes, it's a little tricky to guess, is the professor asking a real question or just a rhetorical question to guide the conversation along? Well, uh, if you think about it, it's not really that hard because the students always seem to know when to answer and how to answer. So as we mentioned before, this is not a real conversation. It's really just one where the lecture itself has been kind of given to the participants to help uh, make it feel a little more like a real conversation. So, let's review. The TOEFL listening section involves the following common spoken cohesive devices. So as we learn throughout the series, uh, we'll often see signal words, especially those we see more frequently in common context, uh, in speaking contexts, but we notice that they're going to be a little bit more simple and less expansive than the ones we see in the reading section. That's often because it's a lot more difficult for students to follow when the if a professor uses a lot of complicated signals. Uh, other common spoken conventions, ideas that we often see with lectures, conversations, and so on, such as direct repetition of words and ideas, pauses and hesitations perhaps, and even changes in the pitch of a professor's voice. We also notice that rhetorical questions, uh, you know, things that professor that will ask, but doesn't necessarily want answers from the students. Rhetorical questions kind of build a natural suspense, and they help the listener kind of understand that the next idea is going to be given to us by the professor. As we mentioned before, the listening section itself will be between 60 and 90 minutes with uh, roughly four to six lectures, some with classroom discussion, and two to three conversations uh, involving an authority figure on campus. Uh, again, we notice that the lectures themselves are usually between the four and five minute range, and approximately our six questions are contained in each one. So going back for just a moment to review the conversations. Remember the conversations are when students interact with a person of authority around the university campus. And usually it's the student who has some kind of problem or situation that the authority figure is going to help them solve. We often think about the authority figure's stance or attitude and how that will often play a part in the conversation. Remember, sometimes the authority figure might be a little annoyed or irritated, but ultimately helpful. Of course, we saw that also the authority figure might be helpful from the beginning, which of course is possible. And the student is usually the one looking for help, and that kind of also indicates his or her lower status in this situation. So part of that will help us understand what the student's asking and why the student's asking it in this way. Now, we talked about that in each listening section, we looked at a totally, uh, a slightly different taking notes strategy. So, for example, in the conversations, we suggested fo focusing on these three areas. Thinking about the problem or situation, uh, thinking about what's the professor's basic attitude. Is the professor going to help the student or not right away? Uh, generally, it just takes a few seconds to figure out what the professor's actual stance is going to be. And then, of course, there's usually some sort of resolution. Now, again, it may not be a problem. It might be a situation. Uh, the professor might be very helpful or the other authority person. So, again, we kind of expect these three areas, but, uh, again, a lot will depend on the situation. Okay, the next part, focusing on lectures. As we said before, the idea here for the TOEFL listening is to see if we can learn new information as well. So not only are we learning how to interact with people of authority, but also recognizing how we're supposed to act in the classroom. 
So we have to think about how can we learn new concepts and technical vocabulary words from the professor. Now, the lectures themselves follow a typical uh, kind of overall organizational pattern. As we said before, there's an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. The introduction itself might be between 30 and 60 seconds. The body might be around 4 minutes. And the conclusion, if it's there, might be between 10 and 20. When we talked about taking notes on the lectures, again, basically we focus on those same three areas, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. As for what we discussed in today's video, the academic conversations, we recognize that these are very similar to the lectures passage, though with students often involved in asking and answering questions throughout the discussion. Students themselves help to guide the professor along, focusing on key points and ideas. And remember, in the video, uh, we discussed the fact that students on the TOEFL are generally very curious, interested, and almost never incorrect. So that often helps us in understanding that the information they're giving is also going to be uh, probably questioned some point in the, uh, throughout the passage. So in terms of taking notes, we generally want to focus on these two areas. What is the general topic, usually st uh, stated by the student uh, question at the beginning? And what is the body that's given? Uh, and again, this is where most of the discussion takes place. Once again, when we talked about taking notes in the uh, video series, we talked about that it really involves the process of active listening, which, uh, of course, is similar to the active reading strategy we mentioned in the reading series. But active listening involves writing down any new technical terms or concepts exactly as they're presented, and especially in the order they're presented but also making sure we paraphrase key ideas by writing other ideas in our own words. So when we're given something technical, we write it down exactly. But we need to kind of follow along, too, and realize that we can't write everything down like in this way. We must paraphrase as well. So again, we might notice that the professor might repeat and rephrase information, but it may not necessarily be important for us to write down every piece of information. This is part of the idea of taking notes in a university classroom. And in terms of a specific note-taking technique, obviously uh, trying to capture as much information as possible is a good idea. But in terms of understanding when a person changes or transitions to a new idea, we suggested that you move your pencil down to the next line each time the professor or authority figure gives a new idea or important detail, especially when the screen changes to a new idea. Uh, in the academic conversations, we said it's obviously we need to move to the next line too when a different student is speaking. This also kind of uh, tells us when we should, you know, kind of write the information down. And remember, taking notes is not the same thing as taking dictation. Once again, we want to remind us that there are eight kind of eight basic question types on the TOEFL. Now, throughout the video series, we tried to identify them based on the information that we're given from ETS. So uh, I pretty much try to do my best in identifying the question types based on this information. But uh, I, obviously, I can't speak to the fact that, you know, whether we were correct or not in the examples. But the idea here is that most of the questions will either involve the basic comprehension ideas of the passage, uh, the particular function of what was said and what people are really trying to say in terms of their uh, in intention. And then finally, how we connect information based on whether we're making a conclusion from the information or connecting content. Uh, some of the questions may also involve how information is organized. Now, in terms of continuing your preparation for the test, uh, again, we have lots of resources available, the official TOEFL website. Obviously, the official guidance of the TOEFL is a good idea uh, and a highly recommended text. And our new TOEFL TOEIC preparation website is, is also available for you to use. Now, students also often ask about how to improve their listening ability. Well, obviously, we don't often have the chance to, um, you know, get engaged with academic material. So uh, I would really highly recommend that if you're going to become more familiar with a test, probably the official guide or some other preparation book series would be a good idea. Thanks for watching this video series. Coming in 2013 will be our series on the speaking section of the TOEFL test.